Antique stores are easy places in which to lose track of time. The clothing from another era has a way of transporting me through time. Sometimes the clothing whispers clues about the one who made it or the person who wore it. Tiny construction details are a testimony to the time period when it was made as well as the skill of the maker. We have such fun recreating these construction techniques for you today. Before we get lost in time, let's see what we can learn. Our modern day heirlooms will have their own stories to tell. Welcome to my sewing room. love baby day gowns. This baby day gown is absolutely precious. This little collar is so sweet and I bet you've already noticed this wonderful embellished piping around the collar. You can see the white part of the piping and then the little pink and then the white and then the pink and then the white and the pink all the way around. It almost looks like peppermint stripes on the collar. Sweet little machine embroidery and what a wonderful place for those of you that are so fortunate to have an embroidery machine. Oh, you know, hand embroidery would certainly be gorgeous here also. And then more of the sweet little piping across the yoke and absolutely beautiful. The piping that is also used at the top of the bias band around the sleeve. This piping is really easy to make. First of all, you make regular piping, you know, whatever seam allowance you need and stitch your uh, straight line of stitching right next to the cord. Then you set your machine to go straight stitch and over several times, straight stitch over several times. And then you have that wonderful little embellished piping. When you insert it in between two rows of fabric, it is so pretty. All you see is that sweet little piping and you can actually do it in two colors if you would like to, which makes it a very interesting trim for, for looking not just one color, but two. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Deb Yadziniak. Deb is an educational consultant for Husqvarna Viking. Deb, welcome to the show. Oh, Martha, I'm so happy to be here. It's <laughs> always fun to share new sewing techniques. It is. This is one of my favorite techniques, and it's a technique I learned in a class many, many years ago. We learned to do yards of our bias core, our bias fabric, and then we did the piping technique. Um, as Martha was explaining, we start with store-bought piping, or you can make your own, and the idea is we need to do a stitch that will do a straight stitch along the straight stitching that made the piping, and then we're going to do a zigzag stitch that goes across that. In the very first class I did, we actually programmed the stitches into the memory of our machine. We programmed in three straight stitches, followed by two zigzag stitches. And these were left-handed zigzag stitches so that the stitches start and end on the left-hand side. And this perfectly placed the stitching right up against the cord and right over it. You want to use your piping foot, and the piping foot has a nice groove in it so that when you place the foot over the piping, the cord actually goes under the groove, and that center needle straight stitch will stitch right up against the piping, and then the zigzag goes right off the edge. Let me show you on the machine. This is the program stitch. I'll snap on my piping foot, place the cord so that the cord goes underneath the groove, and then as you stitch, you'll be doing the straight stitch and then Oops, might help if I select my program stitch. It's always little points like this. <laughs> so here we go with our straight stitch and the zigzag stitch. Straight stitch, zigzag stitch. Deb, that is so pretty. And believe it or not, as you're sewing, you're actually sewing right off of the edge and that thread wraps right around the cord. So you need to start with decorative thread on top as well as in the bobbin in order to get the best result because you want that thread to match and to go right over the edge. Now, 
If you don't have the opportunity to have a machine that has a program capability, then you'll use a built-in stitch. And the stitches that I recommend are some stitches that you'll see here. These could be a blanket stitch or what we call an applique stitch, which is also composed of straight stitches and a zigzag stitch. Here's another version composed of a straight stitch and little diamond stitches that also sew off the edge. And then here we have a seam overcast stitch. So it will be up to you to experiment with some stitches. Now usually the built-in stitches don't allow you to sew with a straight stitch in the center needle position. So this is where you will need to come up with another foot. And here I have some pin tuck feet. The reason I like the pin tuck feet is that there's multiple grooves and with either of these feet or maybe even a braiding foot, you will be able to sew your cord so that the cording is going to be right under the center groove. And then you will have to take a little time to decide how you will adjust the length and the width to get the best look to your stitch and the best placement so that it will sew off the edge. Not only that, let's use some more decorative okay. things by actually uh, changing the way the stitch is laid out here. On this one, we have three stitches close together. Our straight stitch and then three satin stitches close together. Gives an entirely different look here from what we have on our other built-in stitches. And last but not least, use decorative thread on top in the bobbin, but change the color. So on one side we have blue, on the other side we have red. And you can actually alternate, as we did here, showing pink and blue all along the cross because I sewed it twice. I sewed it once with a pink thread and once with a blue thread. Totally different effect. So this well, is a I fun technique. Well, I thought that that pink and red and the pink and blue had a very interesting yeah. trick to it. It Deb, does look fun. Deb, I do love your embellished piping and this beautiful baby day gown. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome, Martha. And now Deb has some really beautiful sewing inspiration ideas for you. Deb, I love knowing that heirloom does not have to be pink and blue for baby clothes. You have the most wonderful heirloom pillows here, decorator things for all kinds of areas of the house. Now talk th about these just a little bit. Well, I've had a lot of fun using my embellishment feet, call them home deck feet, but we use the same kind of feet in our fine heirloom sewing, but here we've got silk fabric. And I love using my pleater, for example, for perfect pleater puffing. Okay. But then we have that ruffler attachment and the ruffler attachment does ruffle so beautifully, especially on heavier fabric, because is it, is, piece it is silk, a double piece of silk. So you need to have a foot like the ruffler attachment that will actually handle the fabric. Of course, the big beautiful machine embroidery in the middle. Oh, the embroideries add so much to it, and you can co coordinate them with the designs and the colors in your house, and that's the best part about doing embroidery. We pick and choose things as a designer. And I love the machine smocking. Oh, machine smocking is one of my favorite things, oh. as you know. Yeah, you so, ran this through the pleater first. Correct. The smocking machine, as that's we call right. it. Through yeah. the pleater. Okay. And that's a smock, smocking in the hoop, or a smocked embroidery as the embellishment. So smocking, again, doesn't have to be for children's clothing. And then a beautiful machine embroidery. Where you, it was kind of a frame. Yes, where because... you chose a picture from the uh, fabric. Right and from then, the fabric. And then that embroidery happens to be a framed embroidery. What a better choice to use. <laughs> Couldn't be better. And what about yeah. these beautiful... Oh, and these are, these are my new spring colors. <laughs> I love these colors. And this pillow features the machine smocking. It's a smocked embroidery. Smocked in But the noticed here we're using the really big cording. This is the big twisted welting. So we need to use the welting foot for that. Then we have this fancy braid trim on the top and we use the left edge top stitching foot. Here's another pillow that features smocking, braiding, piping, more piping, and more ruffles that can be made with our ruffler attachment as well as our gathering foot. So what fun we can do with embellishments home like Home decorating this in addition to... <laughs> deck, you know what? Let's call it home deck heirloom sewing. How's home that? Home deck heirloom sewing. This sounds good to me. It. I like it. We have a new term. <laughs> and now Deb has a so quick, so easy project to share with you. Deb, I love those machine smocked hangers. Show us about them. Oh, okay. <laughs> These are fun. Uh, smocked hangers are something we used to always do in our hand smocking classes. And of course now I smock by machine, but I still like doing the smocked hangers. And initially we started out doing the hangers over the padded hangers. And these have feature a pleated fabric with smocking and some machine embroidery. The same thing here. Leave a longer edge to it so you have a ruffle. 
Then here we have another couple, but these are done on the plastic hangers that are flat. And this version here is done on flat fabric. Lily, who is the grandbaby of a friend of mine, so this is Lily's hanger. And then over here is another one done with eyelet embroidery and smocking. So you can certainly do these smocked or with flat fabric. And let me show you how easy this is to do. Your hanger is your pattern. Simply place the hanger on a piece of fabric, or excuse me, on a piece of paper, and then trace right around the hanger. And then I went down a couple of inches lower because I wanted that to be a ruffle. You do need to mark an opening that's going to be on either side of the hanger uh, curve here. And that's going to be different depending upon the type of hanger you have because sometimes where the hanger comes out is actually dead center, sometimes it's not. So leave yourself an opening and there's your pattern piece. And then here, for example, I've got a pattern piece that I've traced off of my original, and here's a piece of pleated fabric that I could use to make a smocked hanger cover. You'd pull this out to the size that you need for your uh, pattern size for the hanger and stabilize it, do your smocking. And this is one that's already been cut and it has been embroidered. So you can see there's the size there. So that one's ready to be embellished with some lace, sewn up all around the sides with a quarter inch seam allowance, do a little ruffle at the top and you're all set to go. Now Deb, I love what you did here. This is Tell me about this version. Well, this was done as a, say, a garment bag or a, a dress protector. So this could be for that special baby gown, christening gown, baptismal dress. And this is a nice memento. It keeps it clean and safe. Of and it's, the dress would go underneath And the dress the would go here. underneath it. And you do the same shape cutout that you would for the regular hanger, but then you would make it long enough to cover or be longer than the length of the dress that you'll use it with. Deb, thank you so much oh, for you're all so these welcome, wonderful Martha. ideas. And now I have some designer techniques to share with you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, Amelia Johansson. Amelia is the associate editor of So Beautiful Magazine. Amelia, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. I love this technique that it's, you're working, that you've very developed. Sweet. It's oh. a very sweet technique, which I guess you could say I developed it by using the machine, but someone many, many you know years ago actually created this kind of bias shell technique on um, by hand. And this is a piece from Sue Hausman's collection. Martha was kind of instrumental in encouraging her to start a collection of antique clothing, and I believe she found this piece in Ohio. And we've um, determined how to do this by machine, and you'll see it's a little bias kind of shell effect down the front in this panel, around the collar, excuse me, yeah, around the collar, and then around the sleeves. And it's very indicative of the original dress, but it's still obviously very wearable for a child so today. It's very sweet. So let me um, kind of run through how you can do this. Um, you need kind of a batiste fabric is very nice because you're going to be drawing up that fabric into a shell effect. So um, it needs to be a softer fabric, nothing very heavy. You're going to start with a, a bias strip of fabric stitch it into a, um, you're gonna need a seam allowance of fold it in half, stitch it to about a 3 8 inch width and you'll use your bias to turn it, turner and it will, you know, this snaps onto that fabric and turns very easily into a tube. And then you're gonna take your tube, actually set that aside for a little while and you're gonna have to program a stitch for this. There's not a stitch in the machine that will create this effect. So you're gonna program basically a blind stitch with a, um, the three straight stitches in the far left position with about three, three length, three millimeter length, and then a um, zigzag stitch with uh, a six width and zero length twice. So it's gonna stitch over twice basically over that tube and the straight stitches will go off the side. And here we have it illustrated a little bit more closely. You'll see the stitches down the side which go off the tube and then the stitches across the fabric that will eventually draw it in to this effect to create this shelled trim. If you put your seam for your bias in the back, it's a little bit of a rounder um, shell. If your seam for your bias is down the side, you get more of a flat edge and it depends on how you wanna join it as to whether you would like to do that. Um, then you're going to have to go back to your machine and reprogram it for a similar stitch, which has uh, down the center four 
narrower stitches that will go in the center of joining and then a single stitch that goes across. A smaller stitch is going to just kind of join those two together. How we keep them in position is to, we lay out these bias tubes. I have to take this off here on a sticky stabilizer. So you'll position these two and I have two and then I have three joined together. You'll position them on a sticky stabilizer and then again here we have them positioned without stitching them and here it, we'll see how this, the stitch goes down the center, grabs the two shells together, down the center, grabs the two cell, shells together, and actually joins those together. And then you'll remove this. You don't even re remove this from the sticky cutaway as much as you can, and this, this stabilizer will dissolve in water. So after you've got everything all stitched on this, this would be for the center panel, you will dissolve that away and let it dry and then proceed to insert it into your garment. Here is an edge, which would be the same as what you would do either around the collar or around the underarm or the little, you'd finish your sleeve and then add this. Same thing, you would finish the collar and then add the trim around it. So your garment is basically finished. The one thing you need to remember is, you know, leave the width between the collar, maybe cut away a little bit so you, so you make up for that width. But really, most collars have patterns would have, um, an allowance for a, a lace trim. So this would be just in place of maybe a lace trim. So again, you're gonna use your program stitch. It's gonna bite into the fabric, into the shell trim, then down this little kind of uh, alley there where there's no fabric, and then bite in an alley, and then you're gonna have you know your finished collar as well and around the sleeves as well. And it shapes, because it's bias, it shapes really beautifully in a curved shape around the collar. And here we have the example in the curved shape around the underarm seam. And then you would just finish up your garment as you would finish any, you know, the, follow the instructions for so the So we dress. have it down the front, down the as front. we can see here. On the collar, well, you know, Amelia, for something to look a little bit hard, that really, it really isn't is, so hard, it is, is it? It is not a difficult technique. It is just basically programming that stitch. And I'll be honest with you, I it was like a eureka moment for me because I thought <laughs> I'm never going to figure out how to do this. But if you just, in your mind, you know, that the, the, the stitching on the machine has a tension to draw it up. And I thought, oh, for crying out loud, you I did it. it. You and then it. once you've got your trim made, you just treat it like you would any other trim, joining it rather with a bridging stitch than a zigzag. That so. is absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. And next I have some machine embroidery to share with you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest, Denise Applegate Schober. Denise is with Cactus Punch. Denise, welcome to the show. Thanks, Martha. This is absolutely beautiful. What have you done here on this wonderful purchase table runner? I've done a technique that's with embellishment, a special foot, that's a technique foot to put yarn with embroidery or free motion. And I think that it comes either on a machine embroidery CD or you can do it free motion. Is that correct? That's right. And this was an embroidery design. And this is yarn? It here? is yarn. Oh my. How pretty. Show us how that is Great done. Great texture to add to items. So oh, we like jackets, uh, home decorating, absolutely. Oh yes, we need yarn. So okay. that's the first thing. And it's a special type of yarn. You don't want yarn that has like um, uh, hairy things or things hanging off of it. You want a smooth yarn okay. that's going to run through the foot with ease because the foot has a hole in the center of it. Okay, the yarn right. couching foot, okay. So you need the yarn couching foot. It comes in a set of two feet with a threader. It comes with an embroidery design. Now there are other free motion feet and these free motion feet wouldn't work for this. Those will just be for regular free motion, a needle and your regular standard thread. And then you'll need the embroidery collection or what I'm going to demonstrate today is how to do it with free motion. Okay. So I've set the machine up for free motion. Our feed teeth are dropped, so they're down. And we have our specialty foot on that's got the single hole in it, a regular standard embroidery needle. On the back of the machine, there are little attachments that come with the foot set. And they're where you hang your thread or yarn off of. And we're going to free motion. Now notice this yarn is kind of hanging here. Well, the the thread is going to follow, or the yarn is going to follow the foot wherever we want to go, whichever direction we go, and couch it down. 
That is fascinating. And I bet, I know you're doing free motion with no design, but you could even do a little tracing on there. Yes. And follow your design doing the free motion, couldn't you? Oh, you could, or follow things. a flower on a, on a fabric. And oh, absolutely. Do texture. That is fascinating to me. What, did you, what kind of yarn did you say you used on this? Well, it's a, it's a flatter or rounder, smooth yarn. You don't want like a hairy yarn. You don't want something that has um, knobs or little um, nubs inside of the yarn. You want something real smooth to run through that foot. And your particular needle was? Uh, it's a regular embroidery needle, okay. like a 75 or okay. 80. Mm -hmm. Well, this is fascinating. Now, let's look at this. So this piece here is finished and I've basted it in the hoop, but you have your tails. So with the tails, you're gonna use a double-eyed needle to pull those tails through and tie them off on the back. So if we look at the back here that's finished, you'll notice that it's all smooth. These have been tied off at the ends and ready to put on your table. Denise, that is just fascinating. What are we gonna come up with next in machine embroidery? Well, who knows, but I think, we, I think we have a lot now, don't you? Yes. Denise, thank you so much for being here. And now I have a piece from my vintage collection to share with you. These wonderful nightgowns or night shirts or night dresses, as they were called, are made of the most wonderful feeling fabrics. You, you just feel it, it feels so soft and yet it was really sturdy. I might add that these uh, night dresses or night shirts as they were called were boiled. That's the way they uh, cleaned uh, clothes. I can remember my grandmother, my mother telling me about my grandmother, they get, went out Saturday and got the pots open and, and boiled their clothes outside. And this gown would have made it through many, many years of being boiled on the wash outside. This is a beautiful gown. It has the wonderful Swiss embroidery, and it's heavy and sturdy, substantial, as my grandmother would have said. And it has beautiful buttons that come down the front, this beautiful Swiss trim. And many times these uh, night shirts and night dresses did not have any fancy trim. This is a beautiful trim that, ha that is on the sleeve of this night dress also. I'm going to turn it over so you can see the back, which really is just as pretty as the front. I know my grandmother always slept in nightgowns made out of this fabric, and I can remember when I was a little girl and spent the night with her, Nanny always let me wear one of her nightgowns, and I thought they just felt so good. This is a really especially pretty one, and it is substantial, and it would have held up well when it was you, when they boiled these, the clothes on Saturday to get everything clean. Such a thrill to see these things. A lot of you sew, I know you've written to me, you do your sewing from the heart and volunteer sewing for hospitals, for parents that lose a baby at all different uh, stages of development. And this is the sweetest letter that was sent to me by Leslie Green from Toronto. She lost her little niece, Josephine, when she was only 17 days old. And, and you know, sewing is a wonderful way to get through a grief process. And this poem she wrote for her little niece, Josephine. Josephine, I'd like to think of you as a moment stitched in time. As I sewed your gown, I had you on my mind. Josephine, the beauty of your life, no matter what the time, was the gift of love that you brought to the present time. God helped me sew so many beautiful dresses for each bride's special day, to be worn for a day only, then gently tucked away. The gown I stitched for Josephine will be worn forever in time. The woven cross on her chest, a symbol of her beautiful life, stitched in our mind. The special touch of blue sewed here in such a special way, like Andrea wore on her wedding day. To remind us of the lullaby, little blue angel, Josephine has become today. This was Love, Aunt Leslie Green, and this was written to celebrate the life of Josephine Marie Adele Ouet. And she said, we love you, little blue angel. Um, I thank you, all of you who are sewing for those less fortunate and those in times of terrible grief. I personally cannot think of any worse grief than losing a child. And I know so many of you are sewing, you're taking your baby day gowns to the hospitals and, and the nurse is there, by the way. If you wanna make any baby day gowns to be given either to poor mothers or to parents who lose a child, the nurses will know exactly who to give your baby day gowns to. So please sew for some of these precious little ones. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I'd very much like for you to come back next time.